Hey everyone, how's it going? I am absolutely delighted to be back to making videos on YouTube after four months now. Yes. And um, in this video, I will be talking about how to beat the French defense with a tricky sideline on move three. And personally, I really believe in surprising your opponent. I, re I really believe what Fisher said that an opponent that surprised is half beaten and in deviating from the known paths. So if you can get your, your opponent to think for themselves, to be out of book and to be in unfamiliar territory, that's definitely something that I would uh, highly recommend and that um, I would do myself in some cases. So the French defense is uh, my favorite defense for the last uh, five years now. Yeah, five years I've been playing it consistently. It's brought me some good and some bad results, mixed feelings. Uh, overall, I think it's one of the best uh, defenses against 1-4, e and if you're a 1-4 e player, definitely you should uh, know how to meet it. So uh, I think that the other uh, three good defenses are the Karokan, which is 1-C6, 1-E5, one, one e and also the Sicilian 1-C5. So if you have a valid strategy against those four defenses, that's definitely great, and that's essential for every 1-4 e player. Now, um, in this video, I will be speaking about a tricky sideline straight from move three. Um, if you are a competitive chess player and you want to fund your chess progress and you have big dreams in chess, just like myself, then you might be interested in starting a side hustle to an extra income online. If that's the case, go to the link in the description, insert your name and email and watch my free introductory training where you will learn the three secrets my mentors use to generate a consistent income online and how you can do it too, even if you have no previous experience or qualifications. Now, without further ado, I'm going to be sharing my screen and I'm going to be getting onto the French defense. So 1e4, best by test according to Robert James Fisher, and black goes for e6 to the French. Now we play d4, the main move, and now they're going to play d5 more often than not if they want a French. However, we should be aware that they can play c5, and here knight f3 transposes to an open Sicilian. c3 takes us to some uh, favorable version of the c3 Sicilian. And also, um, what else can we do? We can also go d5, which might not be for every 1d4 player because it takes the game to 1d4 territory. It's a Benoni pawn structure. However, it's probably even the best move according to the engine. Anyway, let's say they go d5 and they keep the game into pure French defense territory. Now, the main moves here are knight d2, which was the favorite move of Karpov e5, the advanced variation, knight c3, which is probably the best move, and um, Robert James Fisher was famous for playing it. Also, it featured in the candidates tournament, uh, was the choice of uh, Maxim Bashir Lagrave against uh, Nepomianchi and of Kirill Alexenko against Grishchuk and Nepomianchi, so knight c3. Definitely. And of course, the exchange variation, which uh, along with the advanced are the most likely you will get in a lower level, according to my experience. Well, knight c3 has loads of theory after both knight f6 and bishop before the winner were. The winner were and knight f6 featured in the candidates too. Knight d2 is a great move. However, in the very high level, c5 is considered to be a clean equalizer after e d5, queen d5, not with the pawn, because with the pawn, it's considered that white is slightly better because black will be left with an isolated queen's pawn. So in a very high level here, you can expect them to take back with the queen. Now, what else? The advanced variation is definitely a good choice for white and could be played certainly. And so is the exchange. Uh, the exchange could be a bit dry, but there are quite a few ways you can spice it up and I can make another video about them. But the focus of this video is the fifth most popular move. And already because it's the fifth most popular move, it's very likely your opponents will be unfamiliar with it. Personally, I first came across this move in 2017 when I had went to play in the European Rapid and Blitz Championship and in the European Rapid Championship in Katowice in Poland in the Spodek Center. It was the last round and um, the Polish uh, superstar that's now in the candidates, uh, Jan Christoph Duda, was playing against Wawulin and Wawulin 
had to win. Duda was first with, on, with even a draw, and Bavulin from Russia beat him with uh, Bishop d3 because um, Duda fell into another nasty trap. So Bishop d3 has the reputation of being quite tricky. It's also the choice of chess mood. So if you want to learn more about it, you can have a look at chess mood and what they offer. Um, Bishop d3 is tricky. It's the fifth most popular move. It's likely black will be unfamiliar with it and won't know how to react. Well, the three main moves, and there are others too, and you should be aware of them, but the three main moves are knight f6, which is what they do after uh, knight c3, after knight d2, particularly after knight d2 at the club level. If they want to play for a win, they will probably go knight f6. They won't go c5 because it's a bit dry unless they are fans of the isolated queen's pawn. And there are other choices too, like knight c6, like bishop seven, but knight f6 has always been the most popular move of club players in this position. So someone who needs knight d2, knight f6, they are very likely to meet bishop d3 with knight f6. Now, someone else who meets uh, knight d2 with c5, they are very likely to meet bishop d3 with c5. And that's the topic of this video. However, my personal favorite move here is the move d takes e4, bishop takes e4, and now knight f6, which leads us to the main line of the Schlechter. Personally, I am not a fan of having isolated queen's pawns. Now, how will this happen? Well, if black goes c5, now the best move for white is to go e takes d5. And if black goes e takes d5, now white can either leave them immediately with an IQP if they play d c5 and bishop c5. And here, okay, it's an isolated queen's pawn. However, Maybe the bishop on d3 is a bit misplaced as it blocks the queen. And if whatever white goes knight f3 and black goes bishop g4, then white might want to go bishop e2 just to break the pin. So the bishop will have to move twice. Also, there is a general rule when you're playing against the IQP that you should take on c5 and leave black with the IQP as soon as the dark square bishop of black has moved. So if black had played at some moment bishop e7 or bishop d6, then you want to take on c5. So black essentially loses a tempo, loses a move by having to move the bishop twice. Now, uh, on the other hand, by doing this, you avoid something else because after e d5, e d5, after knight f3, black has the extra option, which is what Anish Giri recommends in his course of going c4 and after bishop e2, then uh, to meet the move b3 with um, c takes b3. For instance, I'm gonna just going to make some normal developing moves. For example, knight f6, castles. Now let's say bishop e7 because a rook e1 uh, move will be coming. But let's say we can even go bishop d6 because rook e1 is going to be met with castles so that there is no discovered check because here white threatens a pawn with bishop takes c4. But let's say castles, now b3. Here, the best move for black is to go takes, and now white takes back with the A pawn. And we get this pawn structure, maybe knight c6 is a very natural move here, and uh, the play will continue. Uh, however, why is it important to take on b3? Because after b5 here, then a4, and if a6, then there is the move a takes b5, and there is no a takes b5 because a rook takes on a8, and black loses a rook, so here they will have to lose a pawn. So this is um, another variation. However, what if they take back with the queen? And this is what people that meet knight d2 c5, so let me just go a bit back. So knight d2 c5 and e d5 and queen d5, these people are likely to do the same after bishop d3 as well. So bishop d3 c5 takes, and now what about queen takes d5? Well, this is not the best move. It doesn't have the best reputation because of a very nasty opening trap, which rises after knight c3, and now queen takes g2, because they might think that you've blundered and you're giving them a free pawn plus hitting the rook. However, it's black who blundered, and now black has basically lost their queen after bishop e4. Why? Because the queen has nowhere to go, and the bishop on e4 is, of course, protected by the wild knight on c3. 
So here you can even win your opponent's queen and win the game in only six moves. So it's definitely something worth knowing if you play one e4, if you play the French defense, and even if you fit into both categories like myself. I play one e4 and I play the French defense with black. So after knight c3, what should they do? Um, well, it's already a very tough position, but if they take the pawn on d4, White gets fantastic comp compensation after the most natural move knight f3, which gains a tempo on the queen. And if the queen goes back, and then bishop f4. And our plan with white here is to go queen e2 in order to go castles and uh, threaten a discovery by moving the bishop and the rook on d1 lined up against the black queen. Knight b5 is also an idea. For example, if they are careless and they go, for instance, Knight c6, we can go here, knight b5, and the threat of knight c7 is devastating for black. They cannot go bishop d6 either. Queen a5 leads to nothing. We just block the check with c3, for example. So they're in serious, serious trouble. This is a very nasty opening trap, and it's likely to occur, especially in a bullet or a blitz, even a rapid game, because your opponent will have very little time to think. And if they are unprepared and in unfamiliar territory, then they are very likely to fall into this trap. So I hope you took value from this. I hope this was useful to you. And um, this is something that you should definitely know if you are a 1e4 player and you want to spice up the French defense and get your opponents into unfamiliar territory. This is great. Like if it's a double round game and they won't have enough time to prepare, then you can certainly consider going bishop d3. Also, um, it's worth mentioning that many times your opponents will face bishop d3 for the first time in their lives. Uh, and it's not the first thing that they will have studied. Now, if your game is going to the database, then you might become predictable. But if you know your stuff, you should be okay. And bishop d3, I honestly believe, is a great way for white to play against the French defense. Uh, if you are black, you should definitely know what you're doing against bishop d3, especially now it's become so popular. So c5, and if you're going to play c5, you should remember to take back with the pawn. So if they take on d5, you take back with the pawn and you play this position. This um, is something that you should play if you like to play with the isolated queen's pawn. And you should definitely look at Anish Giri's recommendations in his chessable course. Well, other good options are the one that uh, Roman Edward gives. So takes, takes, and now knight f6, which um, leads us to other um, interesting positions here after bishop f3, which is the main idea of this variation. And uh, here, for instance, you can go knight c6. And uh, if your opponents go knight e2, that's the main move if they know what they're doing. And now you can go uh, knight c6, and here bishop e3 is the main move, and this is the starting position of um, this variation. Uh, here you can make your own research. I might make another video about it, but the main focus of this video is what happens uh, here uh, and how you can trap your opponent's queen after the move c5, ed5, queen d5, knight c3, queen takes on d4, and now bishop e4. Now, another move that you can play here is under six, but personally, I don't believe in it. I don't think it equalizes. And why is this the case? Because after under six, e5, and the knight has to go back to d7. I believe that white is at least slightly better in this position, and I would like to play this with white, but I wouldn't put my money on this with black. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you took uh, lots of value from this video. Now, uh, if you are a, a competitive chess player and you want to fund your chess progress, such as traveling to tournaments, which has expenses like transport if it's in another city, like accommodation if it's not a one-day event, like entry fees, also if you might want to hire a coach, if you want to invest into chess books and chess courses, like on Chessable, or a premium membership on chess.com, on uh, Chess24, on Chessmood, for example. Chessmood is the website that recommends uh, third bishop e3. Then <coughs> you might be interested in starting a side hustle to earn an extra income online. If that's the case, go to the link in the description, insert your name and email, and watch my free trajectory training where you will learn the three secrets my mentors use 
to generate a consistent income online and how you can do it too, even if you have no previous experience. If you're a subscriber, I will catch you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching and bye for now.